chapter number 6, Revelations chapter number 6. Looking forward to continuing our message on the tribulation tonight. And I hope this series has been a help to you. I've sure learned a lot uh, just going through it and studying it out. How many of you have ever done a study in Revelation before? Anybody done that? A couple of you. And it's, uh, it's an exciting study. It takes a lot of time and effort, but I've sure enjoyed it. You know, I've had a lot of people say things to me like, Pastor, you're doing a good job, and, and I always appreciate that. But, you know, uh, the truth is I haven't really done much. I've just been holding on to the Lord and letting Him take care of everything. You know, I don't know what you're going through in your life right now. Just listen to me for a second. Let me be a pastor for just a minute. I don't know what you're going through in your life right now. But just keep holding on to the Lord. He's our rock. He's our rock. A man isn't your rock. No, sir. He is. Amen? I, this is what I'm telling people right now. How are you doing? People ask, how are you doing? I say, I'm just trying to keep the plane in the air. Amen? Just keep flying straight, amen, and just keep doing what you're doing, and let the rest handle itself. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Revelation 6, look at verse 7. The Bible says, and when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, his name that sat upon him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill the sword with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony that they held. Verse 10, and they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I beheld as he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there were great earthquakes, great earthquakes, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars fell from heaven uh, unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and great men, rich men, chief captains, mighty men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And this is a very important phrase. Don't miss this. It's extremely important. And from the wrath of the Lamb. And from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Father, I pray as we study your word tonight, open our minds and our hearts to what you have for us. Speak to us tonight as we study about what is to come. Lord, you tell us many times in Scripture, let not our heart be troubled, not to be afraid. And Lord, I believe you tell us that because you have a place prepared for us. You tell us. And Lord, I also believe that because we won't be in the, tri in the great tribulation. Thank you, God, for that promise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We've established over the last few weeks that the next event on the prophetic calendar is the what? Rapture of the church. Uh, who's the church? We are. Amen. What does rapture mean? It means to be caught up, to be taken away. And so the next uh, event on the prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. The church will be caught up and taken away. Those who've accepted Christ as their Savior will meet the Lord in the air. Just listen to me for one moment. There is absolutely nothing, nothing in between that moment and this moment right now on the prophetic calendar. There's nothing that will take place between now and that moment. And so in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump shall sound. And so Jesus Christ will return for his, uh, his church, us, and there is nothing that stands in the way between us and that. And so it's a good idea, it's a good idea to get saved, amen, amen. if you're not saved. If, if you're not, you need to be saved because that's a very important thing to understand. After this cataclysmic event, God's program for the nation of Israel will kick off and will unfold before our eyes in Revelations chapter number 6, verse 1, through Revelations chapter number 19, verse 21. This is the, uh, the great tribulation in sequence. Last week, I started the, the sequence of the great tribulation. If you didn't listen to that message last week, 
uh, for whatever reason. I want to challenge you to go back online and listen to that because you're going to get a lot more context to what this message is if you missed that last week. If you're watching live right now at home, don't turn me off and go back and listen. Just finish this out. It's okay. You'll be all right. So in the scriptures, we read tonight that John witnesses the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, sequentially open seven seals. This opening signifies the start of the first half of the tribulation. How long is the tribulation period? Seven years. We read about this in Daniel chapter number nine, when Daniel talks about the 70th week, the, the time of Jacob's trouble. We know that this, this week or this, uh, this time period that Daniel's talking about is a seven-year time period. And so uh, we know that the tribulation is divided in half there's a very important event that takes place at three and a half years, and we'll read about that in a few weeks. But tonight, we're just going to focus on the first three and a half years. Uh, anybody else have allergies right now? What is going on with the allergies, amen? I'd take Benadryl, but you, you could call me the sleeping pastor, amen? I'd be up here sleeping. But. So number one, we talked about this last week, but this is all kind of review. Number one is the beginning of the sorrows. We're in the beginning of sorrows of the first three and a half years. Letter A is the seven seals. And so the first thing that John sees are seven seals the Lamb opens. Let's just review quickly the first uh, several seals that we covered. We covered three seals last week. Number one, the first seal was the white horse and the rider uh, with the bow. And so look at Revelations chapter number six, verse one and two. He sees the Lamb open one of the seals, and I heard as the noise of thunder the four, the four beasts sang, Come and see. And I saw, behold, a white horse, and him that sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. When you consider the timing of the rapture, consider that. Paul describes what he describes in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. I preached a series not that long ago, Faith in Uncertain Times, out of the book of Thessalonians. You can go back and listen to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Paul talks about how there is a, restraint, a restraining agent on the earth right now. You think that the earth is bad right now. The Holy Spirit and the church are still here. And by the way, maybe some of the things that we're seeing around our country that are taking place, I don't know, just might have to do with the church being sh having their doors shut for two months. I'm going to tell you something. Satan is not happy that we're opening back up. He's not. You know, we, we had our, our services, all, all three services today, I felt satanic oppression. All three. All three. He's not happy. He's not happy. That's okay. We'll just keep the plane flying straight. Amen? Amen? We have the Holy Spirit with us, and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 talks about a restraining agent. You know, the Bible says that there's going to be a great falling away. Uh, we see it around us today. We see it. You know that Christians are quickly becoming the enemy in America. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Young people, listen to me. Listen to your pastor. There's going to come a day where you're not going to be, you're going to be the enemy because you believe in Christ. That's what's going to happen. That's what it's happening today. If you look online and you look at social media and things like that, we are the problem. Let me tell you, we're not the problem. We're the answer. He's the answer. We know the answer. Don't be surprised by that. The Bible says that there's going to be a great falling away. And, and, and anyways, i, I got to move on here. But that restraining agent is on earth right now in us as in the Holy Spirit, the comfort of the Holy Ghost. And when the church is raptured and we're taken up into the air, subsequently so will the Holy Spirit. Because wherever the Christian is, the Holy Spirit is. And so both the church and the proliferation of the Holy Spirit will be removed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And the unrest and the anarchy that we've witnessed over the last few weeks, even in our own country, is going to be multiplied by tens of millions across this world when the Holy Spirit and the agent of the Holy Spirit is taken from the earth. And this is where the first horse enters, the hero on the white horse. This chaos that will take place, will set the stage, and I believe it's already being set around the world today, will set the stage for a hero, for a conqueror to ride in on his white horse. That's what this verse is talking about, uh, on the white horse. And this person 
will be a counterfeit, as Satan always has a counterfeit. He'll be the counterfeit of the very Christ, the Antichrist. And he'll come in and he'll bring a quick global peace. He'll have the answers. He'll have all the answers. And, and this peace will come upon the earth. It'll be a very temporary global peace. There'll be a peace treaty made with Israel. As we know, Israel right now has been at war with the surrounding nations for many, many years. There'll be a peace brought to the Middle East. There'll be a peace brought to the world. But it'll be a swift and temporary peace because that's when the second seal is open. And that's when the red horse enters the scene, verse 3 and 4. And he opened the second seal. John says, and I saw or I heard the second beast say, come and see. And I went out another horse that was red. And the power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace. So peace was given. And now this horse is taking this horseman is taking peace from the earth. And so that they should kill one another. And it was given unto him a great sword. This red horse and this white horse seem to operate simultaneously. Uh, they're, comp they're, com uh, they're amigos. They're, they're working together. And uh, we see the white horse is the political figure and the red horse is the military figure. But they're coming in together. There'll be a great war on the earth at that time like has never been seen on planet earth. The red horse will take peace away from the earth. That brings in our third seal or the black horse. Right behind on the, the coattails of that red horse will be the black horse, verse 5 of chapter 6. And I saw he opened the third seal and heard the third beast say, Come and see, and beheld, lo, a black horse, and him that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. This horse represents calamity and famine. There's a great war that's going to be uh, fought on earth. The devastating effects of that war will be felt worldwide. There will be, a, de there will be a, a devastating worldwide famine that takes place across the world. The Bible says that in this chapter that a man will have to work, and that we boiled this all down last week, but a man will have to work an entire day for one meal. People will be starving to death. People will be starving to death. People in mass are not going to have food. Uh, I don't know how you feel when you go to Costco and they don't have what you're looking for. Whether it's toilet paper or whatever, or some kind of chicken or whatever you want. But I'm telling you, in this time, in this day and age, there will be no Costco. There will be no grocery store. There'll be lines of people miles long waiting for their food. It'll be rationed. It is going to be a scary time on earth. That's what this horse represents. Calamity. The, the results of the Great War. Famine and destruction. Governments, borders, supply chains, shipping routes, import-export. All of these will fail. Food will be scarce. Panic and rioting and anarchy will ensue. And this brings us the fifth seal. And that's where we get into some new material tonight. Number four, we see the fourth seal. Did I say the fifth seal? I meant the fourth seal here. The fourth seal. Uh, we're going to talk about the pale horse. The pale horse. Now look at verse 7 with me. We didn't cover this last week, so let's read verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, John says, I heard a voice of the fourth beast saying, Come and see. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, and, on, and his name, notice this, that sat on him was what? Death. Death. This horse, men, uh, was given a name. The other three were not. Notice that. His name was Death, and hell followed with him. And the power was, and power was given him unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, uh, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. It's interesting to note that this word pale here in the Greek is as interesting as Clorox. Uh, chloros, excuse me. Chloros which is where we get the word Clorox from. Isn't that interesting? Do you ever use bleach? It's that pale, kind of a yellow, greenish color. Well, that's where this word comes from, chloros. That word pale, has a, it describes a corpse-like color. It's the color of death. Imagine with me, after the third horse, the red horse is done, excuse me, the black horse is done, calamity is on the earth, people are starving to death, then the pale horse rides in, he describes death. And the Bible says that a fourth part of the earth, or close to two billion people, will die on the earth. Did you catch that? Two billion people. People will die so quickly at this time. Uh, we saw with the coronavirus, people were, uh, th th it, was, it was in certain parts of the world where they had so many people dying and, and different things of that nature. And I know some people don't believe in all that stuff, but whatever. There, there was, there's been times in human history where so many people died where they didn't have time to bury the bodies. They just put them in places for storage. 
At this particular time in history, imagine with me two billion people dying within a very short period of time. There won't be time to bury the bodies. There'll be so much death and destruction. People will still be looking for each other because of the rapture. Where's my mother? Where's my father? I haven't been able to find my kids. And there will still be confusion and death and destruction. And so that's what the pale horse represents. His name, death, and hell followed after him. That word hell means Hades or the grave. Wherever death goes, hell or the grave follows after this word Hades. By the way, even though we die and go into the grave, our soul lives on forever. Are you listening? Every single human being, look up here, every single human being that lives, your soul will live forever, whether it lives in heaven forever or it lives in hell forever, but it will live somewhere forever. You will never die completely. Amen? That's what the Bible teaches. And so the grave follows after. This horse represents the aftermath of the war, famines that come upon the land. So many people will die so quickly they won't have time to bury the bodies. Imagine the pestilence that comes in because of the dead bodies. I'm not trying to be gross tonight. I'm just simply trying to paint a a realistic picture for you of what this time period is going to be like. Now, I don't know about you, uh, how you feel, but watching what's taken place in our country over the last few weeks has opened my eyes a little bit. Hopefully it's opened your eyes to what can happen very quickly. Very quickly. And around this world is going to be calamity like we've never seen. The Bible says, And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, hunger, death. So we are introduced to the four horsemen. Sometimes people refer to these men as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But let me just say, the end of the world is not coming yet. This is just the first three and a half years. We have the white horse or the conquering Antichrist. We have the red horse, the war machine. We have the black horse, the calamity and famine that takes place. And then we have the pale horse, death and destruction. And then John sees a very interesting seal, which I learned a lot about this seal, the fifth seal. Now, this is really, really cool. And I really like this this part here. The fifth seal are the souls of the tribulation martyrs. Now, let's read about these in verse 9 through 11. Maybe you've never read about this or thought about this before, but this really colors in and opens up our our mind to some things about how heaven works. And look at at verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. There will come a time when Christians will be killed for their faith, just like that. And it's happening, by the way, all around our world today. But... In the tribulation period, there will be many killed for their faith. Look at verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren. Notice the distinction there. We'll talk about that. That should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. This is an amazing portion of Scripture. Uh, It brings a rich dimension to what takes place after the rapture and the church uh, and the beginning of the tribulation. The Lamb opens the fifth seal and John sees under this sacrificial altar the souls of them that are slain for the word of God and the testimony that they held. Who are these souls? When were they slain? Why are these souls not in a resurrected bodily form? Well, the location of these souls is very important. They're under the sacrificial altar, which shows us that their lives were sacrificed. They were martyred for God. They were martyred for God. Many in the church age, the age that we live in today, many have been martyred for Christ, starting with Stephen. Remember, Stephen, the men gathered around Paul or Saul at the time held the coats as they threw rocks and martyred Stephen. All, mo- many of the disciples, not all, but many of the disciples were martyred. Peter and all the others were martyred. Paul was martyred. And then throughout the ages, many Baptists, by the way, many Baptists, are you listening to me? Many Baptists uh, have been killed for their faith. Anabaptists, Waldenses have been uh, killed by the Roman Catholic Church and others for their faith. And all I'm tra- simply saying is there have been many through the church ages who have who have been martyred, but these that are mentioned are not those who are martyred in the church age. It's very important to understand that. Who are these souls? Well, these are the souls who died after the rapture. 
What happens to a person who gets saved after the rapture? Well, when they die, they go right here, where this is talking about. Their soul goes right here. These are not those who are martyred in the church age. These are not believers like Peter, Paul, and Stephen. At this moment in the future, in Revelation chapter number 6, as John sees it, at this moment in time, Peter and Stephen and anybody who was martyred or died in Christ were already there in heaven in bodily resurrection form. How do we know that? Because the Bible says that when Jesus returns to the earth, the dead in Christ shall rise. The dead in Christ shall rise. We shall meet the Lord in the air. And so uh, at this particular time, whenever the rapture takes place, these people are already going to be in heaven. These are the souls of those who are killed after the rapture for the word of God and the testimony that they held. Notice it says, for the word of God. I believe that in the rapture, the word of God is going to be illegal. Uh, excuse me, in the tribulation. The word of God is going to be illegal. And by the way, in case you weren't paying attention, it's quickly becoming illegal right now as hate speech and, hate, and, and, and a hateful thing. And so there might come a day, and, and in many countries today, it's illegal to have a copy of this. Are you aware of that? Is everybody aware of that? It's illegal in many countries to carry around this book. We ought not take it lightly that we get to carry this with us wherever we go. But there will, in the tribulation time, it'll be illegal to have the Word of God. And I believe it'll be a death sentence. Because it says here that these are the souls of those who, who are, who are uh, uh, killed for the word of God and for the testimony that they held. They didn't take the mark of the beast. These are those that claim that they knew Christ or who trusted in Christ. I don't know. I think it's possible that many, many will get saved as soon as the rapture happens. That's just what I believe. Now, the Bible says that they're going to be sent a great delusion, and I understand all that, but there's going to be those, there's going to be some, some Christian kids whose parents disappear, and they're going to get right with the Lord real quick. Are you listening tonight? There's going to be some husbands whose wife disappears, and they're going to realize all of a sudden, I made a huge mistake. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. There's going to be some, uh, some parents whose kids disappear in the rapture, and there's going to be some family members whose family members disappear, and I believe many, many are going to get on their knees and say, God, save me. I'm sorry. I should have believed in you, uh, but we, I don't know that for sure. That's just my opinion. But according to the Savior's prophecy in Matthew chapter number 24, verse 9, there will be a great persecution brought upon those who preach the gospel of the kingdom. Would you get your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 24? Matthew chapter number 24. There's, a, there's an important distinction to make tonight, and I'm trying to teach us all this tonight because this is something I had to learn, is there's a big difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of grace. There are two different things. And sometimes you read the two and you think they're the same, they're synonymous, but they mean two different things. And so let's talk about the gospel of the kingdom for just a moment. Look at Matthew chapter number 24, verse 9. Now, out of, uh, just here out of review, who is Matthew chapter number 24 written to? To the Jews, to Israel. And so notice what Jesus says here in verse 9, talking about the tribulation. And notice how this really, this passage of Scripture really dovetails into what we just talked about in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all, what? Nations. Talking about the nation of Israel, for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, betrayed by one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many, because iniquity shall abound, and the love of many shall wax cold. But he that, in, uh, that endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Many people struggle with their salvation, eternal security, because they take this verse out of context. And they think, well, see this verse right here. If you don't endure till the end, you won't be saved. See, that means you can lose your salvation. Yeah, if you don't know who this is written to. Are you listening tonight? Amen. Uh, moving on here, look at verse uh, 13. And he shall endure to the end, it's verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom, notice this, this gospel of the what? Kingdom. kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come, Jesus says. Matthew chapter number 4, written to the Jew, we see he is talking about the gospel of the kingdom that will be preached during the tribulation. 
Who's going to preach it? We'll talk about that in just a moment. Right now, you and I, we believe in the gospel, but it's the gospel of grace. Jesus Christ came. He died on the cross. He, he gave his life. He shed his blood. Whosoever will, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are saved by grace, the gospel of grace. But as soon as the rapture of the church takes place, the, 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 uh, the program for the church will end and the program for Israel will be revived. And that's the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. This is the Semitic program that we've talked about. This is the same gospel, take note, that John the Baptist preached about in Matthew chapter number 3, verse 1 and 2, when he said the gospel of the what? Kingdom is at hand. See, John was the last of the Old Testament prophets. John the Baptist ate locusts, for, you know, wore the thing, you know what I'm talking about? John the Baptist. What is it, girdle? What does he wear? Leather girdle? And John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. He prophesied that Jesus was coming, and then he came. But see, John, like the other Old Testament prophets, they didn't see the church age. They saw over the church age, and they saw the what? The kingdom. And so John says the kingdom is at hand in, in Matthew chapter number 3, verse 1 and 2. This will also be the same gospel that the two witnesses will preach about. Remember the two witnesses that are going to come? We're going to talk about them. They preached about the gospel of the kingdom. This will also be the same gospel that's preached by the 144,000 Jews uh, throughout the world. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached by many and believed on by many, and many will be martyred because of it. The kings of the earth will not like this. The beast certainly will not like this. The mark of the beast will be a way to control these, uh, uh, these rebel rousers, those that believe in the gospel of the kingdom. And they don't take the mark of the beast and they will be hunted down and killed for their faith. And this is the fifth seal. We see the souls of those who are martyred, who are killed for their testimony, who believed in the gospel of the kingdom, who believed in the name of Christ and his return. Because guess what? These were preaching not about the first coming of Christ. They're now preaching about the second coming of Christ. Hey, he's coming. He's coming. Now, he's coming for us for the rapture, but at this moment in time, they're going to be saying, he's coming, but not to take the saints. He's coming to set up shop right here on earth. Amen? In the millennial reign. And so that's what the gospel of the kingdom is all about. The Bible says, have you not read this verse? Absent from the body is what? Present with the Lord. These souls are the conscious disembodied souls of those killed in the tribulation. They're, they haven't been resurrected yet, but their souls are with the Lord under the altar. There is no soul sleep. Some believe that you go on the ground and you're just non-existent until there is no soul sleep. The Bible says that these souls cried with loud voices. They were cognizant not only of who they were, but what time it was. They knew how long they'd been there. They were asking Jesus to avenge their blood. They were very conscious of what was taking place. And they said, how long, O Lord, holy and true? They were crying out to God. Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Interestingly, if you read this, there's a difference between the martyrs. Notice this, very important. The difference between the martyrs of the souls during the tribulation and the martyrs of the church age. What did Stephen cry as he was being, as he was being stoned? Forgive Father, forgive them. And now the souls on the altar are crying, where's your judgment? I believe it's because many of the souls under the altar, this is now, this is my opinion, but I believe many will be Jewish people. And they're going to be saying, where's the judgment coming? Whereas we're saved by grace, we understand forgiveness, amen? And so that's just my opinion there, but just food for thought. These are souls crying out for judgment, contrary to what Stephen cried, who said, Lord, lay this sin, uh, lay not this sin to their charge. Do you see the difference in mentality between the two different kinds of martyrs? But this also shows me that these martyrs under the, under the altar are not martyrs from the church age. Stephen wasn't in there crying, where's your judgment? He already said, what did he say? Forgive them. See the difference between the two? So we understand that the rapture of the church had already taken place. Also it says here, it was said unto them that they would uh, be comforted. God would comfort them. 
He says, you're going to rest for a little season until two different groups of people, fellow servants and also their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. During the great tribulation, many Jews, many Jews will believe on the true name of Christ. Many Jews. But also other people will as well. And these are the brethren and the fellow servants. And so it shows us these two different categories. The fellow servants could be non-Jewish believers and the brethren could be Jewish believers. But either way, this promise will be fulfilled in Revelation chapter number 20, when these tribulation saints will inherit the kingdom and the church will come back to rule and reign. And all God's people said, amen. amen. I want Manteca. I called dibs. Amen. And so anyways, actually I'll take somewhere on the beach. Amen. No, I'm just teasing. But uh, we'll come back. Uh, there are some people that believe in uh, post-tribulationalism. That means we'll be, uh, we'll be raptured uh, post, uh, we'll be raptured at the end of the tribulation right before the millennial reign. Well, if that's the case, we're going to be raptured and then make a giant U-turn in the sky to come back with the Lord. They call it the giant U-turn. <laughs> Yay! What? We're going back? All right, here we go. You know, so I'm not trying to make fun of people that believe that. Please don't get me wrong. I'm just saying it kind of is ridiculous. All right, next here. Number six. We see the sixth seal. The sixth seal. Now, this is natural disasters. Natural disasters. So far, much of what is seen is caused by the horsemen and caused by the reactions of the human race. Rioting, looting, starvation, these kinds of things. But now, God is now opening up the sixth seal and he's bringing his judgment through natural disasters. Verse 12 through 17 talks about these natural disasters. In verse 12, there's a great earthquake. The sun becomes black. In verse 13, stars fall from heaven as the fig tree casteth her untimely figs. Uh, in verse 14, the heaven departs as a scroll. Mountains and islands are moved out of their place. And then you get to verse 15, and it says something very interesting. Verse 15, the kings of the earth and great men and rich men, and chief captains, and mighty men, and bondmen, and free men, seven categories of men, including women here, hid themselves in dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said, fall on us. And they say something very interesting. Please don't miss this. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And then they say something that's extremely important. And from the what? Wrath of the Lamb. Now, what does God say in, in Thessalonians about the church and wrath? We're not appointed un, unto wrath. So these unsaved men, are you listening? These unsaved men recognize the wrath of God better than some Christians do. Just trying to help you a little bit tonight. Because at this time period, we're still in the what seal? We haven't got to the midway point of the tribulation yet, and these men recognize the wrath of God. So that's just some food for thought for some who believe in mid-tribulation rapture, because we cannot be a part, the church cannot be a part of the wrath of God. That's just some food for thought. The wrath of God has already been poured out, seals one through five. It takes more, though, than war, civil unrest, political upheaval, even famine to shake these rich men. If you uh, know anything about rich people, a lot of them have bunkers and food stocked up and all kinds of things. And some of us do, and we're not even rich, amen? But, but these men, I mean, some people have, I mean, the big thing right now is buying bunkers in New Zealand and all these other things, and, and I think I'm going to be a missionary in New Zealand. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, they have bunkers all set up and all these things, and, and, and you know, some of these people are not going to be affected from what happens at this point. They got plenty of food, man, and the world could tear itself to pieces. We got our bunker. We got our, you know, we got DVDs. We got everything we need, and, and they're not going to be affected until God starts to shake the earth, until they start seeing the stars fall out of the sky. And they're going to recognize, they're going to understand all at once, rich men, seven different uh, categories of men. They're going to realize if they've been unaffected by this calamity, even though two billion people have died, well, that's just the way it goes. That's just the way it happens. But all of a sudden, when the earth starts to shake, they're going to realize they're in big trouble. And they actually say, verse 16, and to the mountains and rocks, they cry out, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. They recognize the wrath of the lamb has come, the great day of his wrath. These wealthy people who paid for bunkers are now going to recognize nothing can keep them safe from the wrath of God. 
And they will recognize that God's wrath is being poured out. What did God promise in his word? Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. After the sixth seal comes the seventh seal. So up until this point, we see the, the sequence of times. And I'm going to close. We see the sequence. The four horsemen come. After the pale horse, death and hell come. And there's great calamity. We see the souls of them that are under the altar. Who paid the ultimate price for their testimony. Then after this, God brings natural disasters like the world has never seen. Earthquakes and all kinds of different things. And then the seventh seal comes. Now before that happens, before the seventh seal, the Bible deals with the 144,000. And so next week we're going to talk about them a little bit. We're going to talk about what their purpose was, why they're here, uh, why they'll be here during the Great Tribulation, why they're important. And then we're going to get into the seventh seal, which the seventh seal is actually the seven trumpets. And so we're going to get into that here in just a couple weeks. Are you enjoying this series? Amen. 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 Aren't you glad for the Bible? Amen. I tell you what, I'll tell you what I'm glad for. The rapture. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. As always, we're reminded soberly tonight that yes, we'll be taken away and that's a wonderful God. Thank you for doing that. But Lord, help us to remember those that will not be and help us to continue telling others about Christ and to be a witness for you while we can. With every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody's looking. Maybe there's somebody here tonight. Say, preacher, I don't know for sure I'm saved. I'm done waiting. I want to get that settled in my life. I don't want to wait another moment. Nobody's looking. Brother, would you play for a moment? Maybe you're here. You don't know Jesus as your Savior. Listen, the rapture could happen at any moment. It could happen right now. It could happen 20 years or 100 years from now. I don't know. But it could happen at any moment. I believe it's coming soon. But maybe you're here you say, I don't know the Lord. I, I want to ask Him to save me. That's me. But somebody come show me. I'm going to raise my hand. I'm watching. Anybody like that? I see one in the back. Good. Anybody else? Anybody else? We'll have someone pray with you right now. Anybody else? I'm watching. Anybody else? Anybody else? Don't wait another moment. Don't wait another moment. Anybody else? Christian, can I ask you tonight? May we not forget. May we not forget. This world is surrounded with people who don't know the Lord. They don't have the light of Christ in their life. Let's not get frustrated with them. They don't know God. Instead, let's turn our frustration, let's turn that energy and that anger of frustration into witnessing. Think about Stephen. As the rocks were being thrown at him, he said, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. While the man was being killed, he had the fortitude to say, God, forgive them. Why? Because he recognized they didn't know they didn't, know, they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. Listen, today, let's be Christians that spreads the love of God, that spread the love of God, that spread the gospel. Let's all stand together tonight. The piano's playing. Would you just maybe take a moment wherever you're at and just spend time with the Lord where there's no specific invitation tonight, but it's open if you'd like to come pray. Maybe it's a good time to just say, God, thank you for saving me, helping me be a better witness. Thank you for your word. Thank you that I'm not in the dark. You know, I'm so thankful that God left us with His Word. It takes a little bit of time to understand and study, but boy, I tell you what, it's all there. It's all there.
Father, we love you tonight. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, God, to have our invitation. Lord, we love you so much. Thank you, Lord, for this book that you give us that helps us understand what's going to happen. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us live faithfully to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Did you enjoy that? Did you have something for me? What you got? What you got? Let me see. Yeah? That happened? All right. Where's Nicholas at? Nicholas, did you get saved tonight? Let's give him a big hand. Amen. That's a blessing. Wonderful. Wonderful. If you don't know Nick, that's uh, Brother Johnny's son. And if you can't tell by the fact that he does everything that Johnny does. No, I'm just kidding. And Nick, we're so proud of you, buddy. I appreciate you letting us know. It's the most important decision you'll ever make, brother. Amen. Amen. I'm looking forward to baptizing. I'm going to baptize some of you twice if we don't have somebody new to baptize it soon. But no, I'm just kidding. We have, uh, we have some baptisms already lined up, hopefully for next week, week after. But I appreciate you, church family. Thank you for being here tonight, being faithful. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed. Brother Ashley, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer? Do we have a video to watch after that or no? Yeah, okay. We'll pray and then we'll, we'll, we'll watch the video first and then we'll pray.